How you guys doing with James so far? I know last week was our first little introduction. I always, I really, to be honest, just a little, this might be a little bit too much inside baseball for most people. But as a, pre, as a pastor, I just I hate heart start, starting new stuff because it always seems like no matter how I plan and what I'm thinking, it just never seems to work out the way I want it to work out. And I always feel like I just, you know, laid an egg or something or another and and it didn't come out like exactly like I wanted it to, and you guys uh, didn't really get everything that you needed to get out of that. But let me just venture to say this about the book of James. If you'll hang with James, <clears throat> James is a book that is written in shotgun style. And by that I mean it just scatter. It's like James begins with something, and he's really getting on it really good, and then all of a sudden a rabbit jumps up, and he chases this rabbit, He's, he's, he's like a, really, the book of James is like a bunch of sermon notes, if, if that matters. It's like that. It's like, it's just like, you know, a, a pastor's writing down things that are important, and then the Lord's giving him words and word and word and word, and then something pops, oh yeah, oh yeah, and then you go after that a little while, and then, oh, oh yeah, and then, but he, he brings it back, he does, he catches his rabbit, and he brings him back, so it'll always, there'll always be, Uh, a reconciliation of whatever thought or issue that is going on there. But sometimes as we go through these chapters, there are five chapters in the book of James. And as you go through these chapters, sometimes it seems like all of a sudden you're just, you go to a whole nother subject, you know. And um, so I'm going to try to do my best to to help us navigate this and and get us through because I'm going to tell you that really uh, the honest truth about some theology um, you have to have some theology to, to stabilize your life. I mean, I know when, when I say the word theology, most people's eyes roll back in their head because they're thinking, oh, my, you know, boring, boring. You know, or, you know, they, don't, they think it's going to be too complicated or too complex or it's going to be something that really doesn't matter in their life. But let me just say this to you, that there are... Everything in the word that matters is theology, okay? It's what you believe. It's, it's what you base your belief on. It's why you believe certain things. I mean, we know that we're saved by faith, by believing in Christ, and that Jesus comes into our life and saves our soul, and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us, and that we have a living Holy Spirit in us, and that one day Jesus is coming back for us, and if we don't go to him first, we'll be alive when he comes back and takes all of us to be with him and we'll ever be with the Lord. Every bit of that I just said is theology. Every bit of it is theology. It's what you base your life on. And this is what the word teaches us. This is the value of God's word because God's word uses verses and words and sentences and concepts to let us know what we can expect in life and to, and to let us know how he uh, works through these things and how we are to respond and what we can expect from him and, and how to make it through. So without the word of God, it would just be the philosophy of whoever happens to be up here standing and speaking to you, which to me would be a mighty sad thing. So I, I just want to give you a little heads up about James and, and tell you that I know it may seem like for the first three or four messages, we're going to be talking about suffering, and that's not a happy subject. Nobody likes to suffer, but it is uh, an ever-present subject because we all do. We all suffer in some ways, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, uh, relationally. We all, we all suffer. They're all... We all have issues in life. That's one thing that is common to all humanity is that we all have issues in life. And I know that there are some people, some theologians, some people that preach on TV and in other places that tell us that as Christians we have a birthright. And that birthright is because we belong to Christ and Jesus lives in our life and in our heart that we're not prone to all of those issues that others face. Like, If we have enough faith, we won't have flats on our automobile. If we have enough faith, our house notes will always be paid. There will always be a chicken in every pot and two cars in every garage. And and we won't be sick if we have enough faith. 
And if we get sick or if we get a flat or if we car gets repossessed, it's because we've sinned against God or we don't have enough faith, one or the other. Let me just tell you what that is. It's wrong is what it is. God does not promise us. Do you know what the essence of the Christian life is as far as, as struggles go? You're going to have them just like everybody else. You're not isolated from the struggles of life. But what God, yeah, because of sin. sin uh, lust brings forth sin and sin brings forth death. You'll see that in the book of James. The original LSD, lust, sin, and death. Yeah. And that's why we all suffer, because we're all sinners. Look at, your, look at your neighbor and say, you're a sinner. Yeah, you are. Don't try to deny it. And I am too. You know, you could look right up here at me. I'm a sinner. And that's why we need a Savior, because we're all sinners. And none of us are perfect in life, and none of us can live the kind of life that, that raises us <coughs> above the issues that every other part of life. And so... Just to kind of uh, reflect back just a, a moment, I want to go back. Uh, I, want to, I, want to cover, I want to read the, fir the first eight verses. That's what I read last week. And I want to just go back and I want to preach another message uh, with a little bit different insight, with a little bit different point of view about this thing of suffering as a Christian. Because the whole first chapter, guys, is about suffering as a Christian. Why you suffer. What God is doing in your suffering. Why God would allow you to suffer. What you need to learn through your suffering. What good is suffering. Can you always count on God? Does God always come through? That's what the whole first chapter of James is about. And so it's very vital, I think, <coughs> so that, that we all... I think it'll bless our lives if we can understand some things about, about this, this strange little tool. And I'm saying that it is a tool of God. Suffering is one of those strange little tools that God uses to work into our life things that can't be worked in any other way. Now, you remember, as a matter of fact, let's just read the verses. <coughs> Here are the verses, beginning of verse 2. You know, the first verse, James, bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, greetings. That's the first verse. He's writing to the 12 tribes. And, and he really needed to because, just think about this. In the day that James was writing, the Romans were in charge. The Romans were people who believed that their Caesar was the Lord. And so the Roman citizenry, when the Roman citizens would, would meet each other on the sidewalk, Here's what they would say, Caesar's Lord, Caesar's Lord, Caesar's Lord, Caesar's Lord. That, that was their gre greeting when they greeted each other. Well, of course, obviously, when these Jewish believers became Christians, now they had a double whammy. They were Jews, so they were hated anyway by the Romans because they had another God and blah, blah, and they wouldn't say Caesar is Lord. And, but when they became Christians, now they were really alienated from the Romans because instead of saying Caesar is Lord, the Christians would say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And, and so uh, subsequently, the Christians had real conflict with the Roman government and the Christians were fed to the lions and, and uh, killed by the gladiators and sawn asunder in the arenas for the, uh, for the entertainment of the lords and the ladies. And it was to these Jewish Christians who were in these suffering, persecuting times that James writes the words that we're about to read. Now imagine being in that kind of a situation where every moment of the day your life is on the line. I mean, the next knock on the door could be a soldier dragging you to the Colosseum to be the next exhibition of how strong their gladiators were so that everybody could drink wine and laugh whenever they cut you in two in the middle of that Colosseum down there. Simply because you didn't believe that Caesar was Lord, you believe that Jesus is Lord. Yeah, yeah. And to that, James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its 
And I'm going to just add to an IG, have its perfecting work. Patience is, works something in you. It, it perfects you. It ripens you. It matures you. Patience has a work to do inside of you, but let patience have its perfecting work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. In other words, when you go to God and say, God, I don't understand my suffering, God says, well, let me lay it out before you. God doesn't look at you and say, you dummy, why don't you understand this? You're so, you, you're so slow. You never get anything. Why don't you understand all? No, God is not going to reproach you. God understands you. God loves you. And God will answer this without thinking that you're some kind of dummy. That's what James says. Ask him if you need wisdom about what you're going through and why you're going through it and how you can make it through it and what is it going to do. Ask God. He wants to tell you. God, it, it, it's God's nature to give, folks. Yeah. It's God's nature to give, just like it's the nature of light to produce light, and just like it's the nature of uh, fire to produce heat. It's the nature of God to give. That's God's nature. So let him ask in faith without doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So James is, is, is talking to us about suffering and about what God does through the sufferings of life because we are going to face suffering. And the key phrase in this whole issue in, that we've read is back in verse 3, and I know I said it to you enough last week, maybe you'll remember it, knowing this. When you're in the midst of suffering, you're not going to make it through because you feel something. You're not going to feel joyous in the midst of suffering. It's ridiculous to think that. Grandpa just got ran over by a tractor. He's gone on. Well, glory to God. No, no. My wife just left me and ran off with a salesman. Praise the Lord. You know, no. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? That's ridiculous. So you're not going to be able to feel your way through the issue of suffering in life. So James says, look, I'm telling you to be joyous not because of the way you feel, but because of something that you know. He doesn't say feeling this, blah, blah, blah. He says knowing this. So I, I, I've, got to, I, I've got to know it's based on something I know. Because you're not going to get in the middle of something that's really tough and all of a sudden feel real joyful and real joyous about it and say praise the Lord. So <coughs> James tells us we all suffer. And you remember from last week, and I'm not going to just keep dragging up last week, but but I do want to acknowledge the fact that I mentioned it to you, that in the, first, the, the verse we read, it says, when you suffer. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't say if. I wish it did say if. Because that might mean that, hey, somebody might get by without suffering. But it doesn't say if. It says, when you suffer. Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. Now listen, in case you think I get any delight out of telling you this, Seriously, I do not get delight out of telling you this because I, I'm one of you. I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat you in. I mean, being a preacher doesn't, doesn't isolate me from suffering either, even though I live on Marshmallow Lane and Honeycomb Road. And oil flows from my mouth and anointing flows out of my ears and I'm just a wonderful human being. It, I mean, it, 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 it's that strange little too. So then how do I face suffering? If I, don't, if I don't understand it, how can I make it through? Can, can we always count on God? Does God always come through? Well, I know we won't, you know, that's what we have been trained to say and we do believe that ultimately. But if you just look at it through human eyes, I mean, just a plain old everyday person on the street eyes, uh, the answer would have to be no. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't come through. We all love to hear the testimonies of people that, uh, quit, <clears throat> that quit a job for some godly reason, and then the next day they get a job and make twice as much money. And we love to hear about people who come to church and their marriage is rocky and things are going bad and they are at church for about two or three months and God does something in their life and all of a sudden, boom, man, their marriage is just wonderfully happy. We love to hear that. We love to hear how somebody started tithing and the next day they got a big raise on the job. 
But what we don't hear about very often are those that start tithing and get fired the next day and have to work three jobs to try to pay the power bill or the, or the marriage that didn't get put back together again or the deal that didn't work out. And so just looking at life right on the surface level, we would have to conclude that Sometimes God just doesn't seem to come through. I mean, we love the great testimonies of putting life back together and having wonderful life and getting new people and just being great. We all love to hear the testimonies of that stuff, but it doesn't happen every time, does it? As a matter of fact, you know what I've found in reading the Scripture? God seldom specializes in the last-minute rescue. All right, all right. I mean, really think about it. God didn't rescue Daniel from the lion's den. <laughs> no. He went right on through. God didn't rescue the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. No, they went right on through. He didn't rescue Paul from prison. He spent three and a half years, then got his head cut off. He didn't rescue John the Baptist from prison. Salome did the dance and requested the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter, and she got it. He didn't rescue John, the great apostle on the Isle of Patmos that was banished there because of his, nothing else but his simple love for Jesus. That's all it was. John just loved Jesus and got banished to the Isle of Patmos and lived there and died there on the Isle of Patmos. God didn't rescue. Why, why God even stood by when this crazy world took his only begotten son and took him down and strapped him to a rock and beat him to a pulp. And then took him and put him on a cross and drove nails through his hands and feet and hung him up in front of everybody and spat on him and mocked him and ridiculed him and then stuck a spear in his side and, 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 and laughed at God. And God just turned his head and walked right on by. Did nothing about it. So, how do we handle it then? How do we deal with it as his children? when it seems like God doesn't come through for us. Well, I got seven suggestions for you. You, you ready for them? <laughs> number one. Let me see if I got it up here as number one. I sure do. Remember, when, God, when it seems that God doesn't come through for you, remember the proven dependability of his love. All right, I'm going to give you just a second to write down the word in the blank. When it seems that God doesn't come through to you, for you, remember the proven dependability of his love. I'm just saying to you simply, remember the times when he did come through. I'm saying focus on the good things that God has done for you. When it seems like that whatever the latest thing is and it just didn't work out and it didn't come through, think of the things that God has done for you in the past where every single one of those things testified to you. He does know me. He does care about me. He does love me. Andre Crouch, y'all, listen, I, I used to do a lot of singing. I did, and, and uh, thank goodness I don't have to do a lot of singing anymore. We have some real singers. But if Buddy's watching online, he can testify because he, sang, he and I both sang this song so many times, I can't even tell you how many times, hundreds of times probably. It was, it was written by a guy that's gone on to be with the Lord now. His name's Andre Crouch. And it started like, it started like maybe you'll remember, how can I say thanks? For the things he has done for me, things so undeserved, yet he did to prove his love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. That, yeah, Sing. all that I am and ever hope to be. I owe it all to thee. On, then he sings, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. Listen to this. With his blood he has saved me. With his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. How about that? I'm not talking about how about the song. I'm not talking about how about the song. I'm talking about how about the thought of that song is what I'm saying. 
I'm saying, how can I say thanks for God? And what about this one, you hymnal folks? When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, and you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, angels will attend, help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, well, never mind. <clears throat> that is what I'm talking about. I'm just saying that if you will remember, I believe that there will be some times that come to you where God definitely did show up. He did handle an issue. He did save you from some peril. He did work in your life. He did do the things that said to you, I love you and I haven't forgotten you and you are special to me and you meet unique to me. And God loves us. God died for us. Jesus came and gave himself for us. That is the ultimate proof of all time that God loves us. So when things don't seemingly go my way like I think they ought to go, don't get angry and upset about it. Remember the proven dependability of God's love. Let me, let me tell you one, one little story. John Bazzano, and y'all don't even know John Bazzano. He is pastor emeritus of First Baptist Church in Houston. He's probably, I don't know how old John Bazzano is now. Um, he, and not even sure that he may still be alive. But back when he was early, young preacher, he was in evangelism. And so I listened to him preach a lot. I like him and he was great. And he, showed, he, he told a story one time, and I'll never forget what he said. He said when he was preaching a revival in California, he had three, like three revivals in a row. So that means like three weeks in a row. His family lived in Colorado, and he was going to be gone three weeks in a row. So it, it, it just seemed to work out that on one, at the end of this particular meeting in Los Angeles, if he could catch the plane on time, that he could fly and he could, stay, he could be in Colorado for a few hours at home with his wife and family before he had to go to Memphis. And so, man, as soon as the meeting was over on Friday night, and I know exactly how he feels. I've been there before. And, you know, any of you guys that have been away from home very long, man, I mean, it's like a magnet at the house pulling you, you know. And, and the further you are away, the stronger the magnet is. It's amazing. But anyway, the he jumped in, the deacon, you know, pulled his car around, he jumped in, they went to the airport, and just, he said, just as we got to the airport, he said, the plane was was backing away, or was moving away from the loading chute, you know, about 30 seconds, a minute earlier, and he would have been on that plane, and, and going, and he said that they turned around, went back to the hotel, he said, when I got back to the hotel, got in my room by myself, he said, I began to give God a piece of my mind about how much I had been mistreated and how much I had sacrificed for him and how much I had done and look what I'm doing and I'm giving my life for you. And looks like you could make one arrangement for me, God. Look, looks like you could hold a plane about 30 seconds for you. And anyway, he said he went to bed and, and he said woke up in the morning and he said he went down to the hotel lobby and they had a little, some little cereal or something and he started eating a little breakfast and he picked up a newspaper. This tells you how long ago that was. Picked up a newspaper. <clears throat> and a headline in the newspaper uh, rep was, was reporting a crash between a United Airlines uh, passenger uh, plane and a Continental jet over the Grand Canyon, and everybody was killed. And it was the worst natural plane disaster in our country at that particular time. Needless to say, breakfast ceased. John said, I got on my face before God, and I said, God, thank you that I wasn't on that plane. And he said, every once in a while, he said, it's been 50 years ago, but every once in a while now, I even... Stopped, bow my head, and said, thank you, Lord, for not being on that plane. You see, if you'll think about it, I believe that you can see some times in your life where God has done some things for you. And he's protected your life, and he's kept you safe. And by those things, he keeps reminding us that he is there, that he loves us, that, that, that he has more for us to do. And, and by the way, this thing, this verse says that we fall into various trials, not, not just a trial, but trials 
And, 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 and here's the truth about a trial now, and, and weigh it in your mind. Here's the truth about a trial. It doesn't have an answer. If it's a trial, it doesn't have an answer. It's still, yeah. In other words, I'm not going to be delivered from something that doesn't have an answer. Because if it had an answer, it wouldn't be a trial. I, I mean, you, know, you, you, you need $10,000. Here you go. Here you, here you go. You need $10,000. You say, man, I got a problem. I need $10,000. You're right. You go down to the bank, and the bank loans you the $10,000. Well, you don't have a problem anymore. You got $10,000. You go down to the bank, bank looks at you and says, I ain't giving you a dime. Now you don't have a problem. You got a trial. And that trial has no answer. There is no answer. There's no way to escape from a trial. And so James says, look, when, 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 when it seems like God doesn't come through and when it seems like you didn't get what you prayed for or that you don't understand what the answer is, don't fall off the wagon. Say, God, thank you that you love me and I know it in spite of the fact that I didn't get what my little selfish idea was at the moment. All right, number two. When it seems like God doesn't come through, remember the sufficiency of his grace. And I know that sounds just like a preacher because I am one. I just couldn't think of a better way to say it, y'all. I really started to, I said, what can I say? How can I say sufficiency of his grace in a more modern way? Well, here's what I'm, what I'm saying by that. All right. The, the focal point of suffering in the New Testament, now let me just tell you what the whole New Testament says about suffering in a nutshell. The whole focal point of suffering in the New Testament is that we Christians are not isolated from suffering, mm -hmm. that we are going to suffer. But because of something that is on the inside of us, are you hearing me? Because of something that is on the inside of us that gives us strength on the inside, that gives us a resiliency on the inside, we have basically an insulation. We're not isolated, but we are insulated by something that can give us the strength to cope with whatever it is that, that is happening in in, the, in this world. See, we, we have many of the same problems that the people who never darkened the door of the church have. We have many of the same problems who people that never pray, never talk to God, never have asked Christ into their heart. We have the same problems that many of them have. But, but, but the way we cope with that problem is we don't go shoot up. We don't go snort up. We don't go blow up. We, we, we have a different way of handling things. We have a different mindset about how you go about dealing with all of these things. And that is the insulation of the Holy Spirit in our life that says, hey, you don't have to fall apart when things around you are. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Let me, let me give you a verse. This is 1 Corinthians 10. You know this verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Yeah. What is that saying to you? That is saying to you, well, that everybody faces the same issues. I know when you get an issue going on and when you're disappointed by the fact that it didn't work out like you thought it was and God didn't pull the hammer the way you thought it ought to be pulled and he didn't open the door or that you're wondering where he is. And I know you have the tendency to sit there and say, uh, nobody has suffered like this. Nobody knows what, what is happening to me. And to which I'm just simply going to say, uh, don't bet on it. Because this verse says, nothing has overtaken any of us, but such is common to all of us. How do you know I haven't been through what you're going through? And let me just say this to you. If I haven't been go through what you're going through, it might happen next week to me. Because I'm a human being and we all go through the same kind of trials and temptations and struggles and issues and hostilities and factors of life. And so the Bible says, look, God has a grace that can handle these issues of life because we all go through the issues. And he says, I got good news for you. God knows your level of surrender. 
So God knows, let's say, hey, if uh, in the level of temptation on the temptation meter, if your temptation can't go above uh, 1,000, that verse says God's not going to let the struggle go above 1,000. If it does go over 1,000, look what it says. He's able to make the way of escape. Yeah. In other words, God is not going to allow you to be overwhelmed by the devil. He's not going to allow you to be run ramshod and roughshod by the devil. He has an understanding of you. Do you know that Jesus faced all the temptations that we faced, and yet he did not sin? So that means Jesus has reached levels of temptation you and I can't even imagine. You know why? Because we would have, we would have given it up before we got to that level. Yeah. But Jesus didn't, and he went to levels above it. But God knows where our level is. And when we get to certain levels like that, the Bible says that God will open up a door and make the way of escape. And before you get too happy about this way of escape thing, I, I, I looked at this also, and I thought, escape, hot dog. Man, that means I'm going to be able to get out of it. But just a reminder... <laughs> Just a reminder now, look at the rest of the verse. The verse doesn't end with, he will make the way of escape, period, boom. It says, he will make the way of escape, what does it say? That you may be able to bear it. In other words, you, you are not going to get, you're not going to escape, you're just going to go through it. The word, actually the word there uh, means to uh, 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 escape through the middle. That it means it means just you, you're going to escape, but you're going to have to keep on walking through it. You're not going to just magically disappear out of it. It means God's going to take you through the middle of that thing. So what I'm saying is when things get to be tough, remember that God loves you and he has shown you that so many times and done so many things in your life. That, you ought to, that, that if you really think about it, you'll, you'd be ashamed to say, God, you didn't come through for me. Remember when he did come through. Remember what he's done for you. And then remember that his grace is going to do something on the inside of you that's going to allow you to make it through the middle in spite of the fact that everything else around you is just blowing to pieces. All right, let me give you another one. All right. Can we handle another one? All right. Remember, now here, here's the third one. Remember the revelation of his purpose. What this means is that God clearly has revealed in Scripture that he has a purpose for you. Would you like to know what your purpose is? When I say it, you're going to go, oh. I'm going to show it to you in the Scripture, all right? You say, you don't know what God's purpose for me. I do. I do know what God's purpose for you. I know what, I know what God's purpose for every one of us are. Let me show it to you, and when you see it, you're going to go, oh, yeah. Here's Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What does that say? That says God has a purpose for me, and that purpose is that I would be like Jesus. So you know what God does, and I said this last week, and I'm not going to bore you with saying it again because I've said it to you, and all of you that have been in class have heard this kind of thing before. But I just want to remind you that what God does in every one of our lives is he starts where we are. Look at your neighbor and says he starts where you are. Okay, like me, um, maybe I'm a nice person, or maybe I'm not prejudiced, or maybe I'm not self-centered, or whatever. Well, God looks at me and sees the things in me that are not like Jesus, and he begins to shape me, all right? He looks at you, and you are selfish, and you are prejudiced, and you do have a, well, of course, he's going to start where you are, shape knocking off the stuff that's not like Jesus. So some of us have further to go. Some have harder things. But the point being that no matter where you are, when God starts chipping on you, it hurts. And God keeps chipping on us. All the way through our life until he takes us home with him in heaven. Because I know in spite of what some people say, you are not perfect. And you are not going to be perfect on this side of heaven. But it doesn't mean God's not going to quit chipping on you. Because he's trying to create you like Jesus. All the way through your life. And whatever it is you display, whatever attitudes, whatever uh, uh, carnalities and issues and whatever it is you want to call them, as you, be you begin to display that are not like Jesus, then God begins to 
chip those things away. And, 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 and so that's why I think we can rejoice in, in the trial because we know something. What do we know? We know that when God is chipping me and when God is dinging me, when I'm hurting like that, I know something. You know what I know? I'm becoming more like Jesus. I'm becoming a more capable person. I'm becoming more reflective of the glory of God in my life. God is working his purpose in my life. Okay, so number one, the dependability of his love, the sufficiency of his grace, the revelation of his purpose. Let me give you this. Remember the delight of his person. The delight of his person. I know that sounds just like a preacher, but again, I repeat, I am one. And I don't know how to say that. That's just a romantic way of saying uh, we need to learn how to rejoice more in who Jesus is than in what he does. That's just the way of saying it. Most of us blow hot and cold spiritually based on what God's doing in our life. If we're happy with God, then man, we are on fire with God. Hallelujah, God gave me a raise last week. Woke some of you up, didn't I? Pay attention. You know what this ver you know what this is saying? It'll be a great day when we can walk into church next week and go, Hallelujah, I got fired this week. Don't know how I'm gonna make it through life. Praise God anyway. That's right, that's right. In other words, to be happy about who Jesus is rather than what Jesus is doing in your life at the moment. If you're on an up and down spiritually, depending on what God's currently doing in your life, your life's gonna be like a, a spiritual yo yo. I mean, you're going to be good one week and down the next week and up one week. We got, hey, we got some yo-yos. They'll yo-yo back in here before long. I guarantee you, we have so many yo-yos that if they came to church, this place, we couldn't pack them all in this place. Why? Because whenever God's working for them, they're here. When God's not working for them, they're not here. Whenever they want something from God, they come in thinking they're going to talk God into it. And then whenever they find out he ain't giving it to them anyway, then they leave. That, man, that, 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 that's never going to produce stability and a solid life for you. You're going to be going up and down, up and down all the time. I mean, that, that's not what God... Let me show you this verse right here. Let me just show you, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next one. All right, Luke 10, 20. Nevertheless, this is Jesus. He's, he's, had, he's had 72 of his disciples that have been sent out to witness to the world. They're all beginning to come back now. And Jesus says to them, nevertheless, and they're all happy. They're all fired up. They say, man, Jesus, the demons are obeying us. The demons, we're casting out demons. Man, this is exciting. It's wonderful. Look at what Jesus says. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In other words, you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, look, don't get happy about things that are temporary. Get excited about things that are eternal. You know why? Because there's going to come a day when these demons are not going to obey you. Yeah. There's going to come a day when you say, get out, demon, and the demon's going to say, man, get away from me. Yeah. So you can't rejoice over temporary things over things that don't have any value. He said, look, re rejoice because I'm yours. Rejoice because you're mine. Rejoice because your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Rejoice because you're going to heaven when you die. Rejoice because the blood of Jesus is washing you clean. Rejoice because you have a relationship with me. Rejoice that nothing can separate you from my love. Rejoice over, over, over the delight of Jesus. I'm just saying to you, man, when things start crumbling in your life, you got to rejoice. And what is it you're going to rejoice over? You're going to rejoice on the fact that things are crumbling in your life? What, are you, we need to take you down to Memorial Behavioral down here or something or another? No, man, you're going to have to focus on something else. On the fact that God loves you and has always proven he loves you, that his grace is on the inside of you and is sustaining you, and you can cope without pulling the trigger or drinking the bottle or whatever it might be. He's given you other mechanisms to cope. His grace is sufficient for all of that stuff. And we're rejoicing over his person, who he is, who Jesus is, and the fact that he's accomplishing his purpose in my life. When it seems he doesn't come through. We're just going to seem that a lot of times. Now, I'm telling you, I'm just warning you. It's going to seem that a lot of times because we're so blooming temporary. Number five, remember the mystery of his ways. 
Here, just to make it in a nutshell, is God has ways and God has acts. All right, follow with me. Uh, It was an act of God. It was an act of God in number 17 to send a bunch of little fiery serpents. These were little serpents. I don't know if they were red, but the people called them fiery. So it must mean either that when you got bit, it was like fire or they looked like fire. But these little boogers were mean. And when they bit you, I mean, God just filled the whole camp up. You know why? Because they couldn't be happy. Yeah, they couldn't be happy. Every time God did something, they just gripe, 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 gripe. Why can't we have this? I don't, I'm, I'm tired of all that old man or that white bed. I don't know what it is. Well, we don't have enough water. We going in the round round. I mean, they just gripe, 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 gripe. God said, I'm going to give you something to gripe about. And all of a sudden, these little fiery serpents. And listen, when they bit you, you died. No, 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 no question about it. You died. Yeah. And, 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 and then God told Moses, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to get, this, get some brass, and I want you to shape it into the, snake, in, into the shape of a snake, and I want you to put that brass snake on a pole, and I want you to put the pole in the middle of the camp. Now, remember, these are the acts of God. This, this is the, an act of God. Put the snake in the middle of the camp on a pole, and when somebody's bit, if they'll look at the snake on the stick, They'll, 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 they'll be all right. They'll revive. If they don't look at the snake on the stick, they die. So don't you know some of those people thought they had a better way? Don't you know some of those people that got bit by one of them said, ooh, ooh, I'm bit, I'm bit. And, and, then, and then one of them said, wait a minute, you know, I've been hearing some news. This news is, you know, there's really great power in our minds, and if we can just focus our minds on the fact of driving that old poison out of my vein, I'm driving the poison out, I'm driving the poison, then I can live. Oh, yeah, he died. Um, and then some of them said, you know, I've been hearing about this new religion, this Hare Krishna poison stick, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking if I'll just get down here and meditate and om, um, om, um, you know, and I'll just do my little enchantments and all of that. That, that, that nasty poison will just drive out of my veins. Yeah, he died. Uh, that was an act of God. The way of God, that was God's way of showing them that his provision was going to involve someone who was going to hang on a stick and die for all of them so that if they would look at him, they could live. It was preparing them. That was the way of God to prepare them for Christ who was going to come into their life. I mean, it was the way of God. Look, 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 let me just settle one. It was the way of God. God took his son, beaten to a pulp, hung on a cross, blood flowing down, people laughing, mocking, and ridiculing him, I can't think of a more barbarous act in the history of the world. You would have to look at God and say, God's cruel, man. God does, God's vicious here. What in the world if you looked at that act of God? But it was the way of God to bring salvation to all of us who are sitting in this building and to everybody else in the world. I'm just saying to you that when things don't happen like you think and you think God didn't come through, try to separate the acts of God from the way of God. God has, I mean, the temporary act may seem senseless or it may seem hard or, you know, I mean, here's the act of God, Paul sitting in a prison, the act of God, Paul sitting in a prison for three and a half years. It was the way of God to get three-fourths of the New Testament written so we could read it and know that the just shall live by faith and, and, and in Christ I can do anything and, and God is it, God, but my God shall supply all your need. It, it, it was the act of God to banish an old man to the Isle of Patmos for nothing but loving Jesus. But it was the way of God so that God could communicate him on the Isle of Patmos, the book of Revelation that revealed the end time things and the coming of Christ at the end. I'm just saying to you that, that you have to evaluate the ways of God and the acts of God. And that sometimes the way of God may seem a little bit harsh. It may seem a little bit tough, but... 
But that's the way God accomplishes a purpose. I mean, how can he accomplish his purpose? By things that don't make sense to us sometimes. Let me give you this, these last two real quick. I know it's time to go, y'all. Remember the promise of his tomorrow simply says, all things work together for good. I'm going to just skip through. All things work together for good uh, to those that are called according to his purpose. Uh, it, it says all the things are going to work together for good, but it doesn't say when. Okay, doesn't say when, right? Uh, see, we think, okay, all things are going to work good now. No, it didn't say now. It might take decades. You might not ever see it. Uh, here's a verse uh, out of Hebrews 11, Hall of Fame of Faith in the Bible, and all these, it named them all, uh, uh, Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Gideon, Barak, uh, Samson, uh, Jephthah, blah, blah. It just names all these people, these great champions and heroes of faith. And then it says, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. In other words, they got promised something that they never saw. I'm just saying to you that whenever the Bible says all things work together for good, it might not be in your lifetime. We have to accept some things, right? There are a lot of people that fought in World War II, didn't live long enough to enjoy what this country became after World War II. They gave their life so we could have enjoy the life of future. And that's what happened here. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. In other words, God, they didn't get the promise. We did get the promise. And so God has given us a promise of, 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 of tomorrow, that, there, that all these things are going to work together for good, and, and, and it's going to bless somebody's life. Can any of you be happy if your grandchildren are blessed inside of you, in spite of you, or instead of you? Sure. Let me give you one more. This is it. Remember the joy of his presence. Remember the joy of his presence means that whenever I'm in the midst of suffering, he's there with me. That's what that means. It means whenever I'm going through some tough stuff that God's right there with me, that I experience something about God when I'm going through tough stuff that I don't get at, at any other times. Have you ever heard anybody give a testimony about this terrible time in their life? There was so much heartbreak, heartbreak, tough, bad times, all that. And then at the end of that testimony, they said, but I tell you, man, it was worth it all. It was because of the presence of God in their life. Because they experience something. Let me show you in the Psalms. I'm quit. I promise you, I'll quit. You, I, I know you're saying I heard that before. But I am, I promise you. All right, look at this. Just, just watch. All right, here's David, Psalms 23. David's having a great day. David's just talking. David's just writing poetry about God. The Lord is my shepherd. That's good. Okay, God's my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Good, David. That's so comforting to think of that. Isn't, it? Isn't that nice? That's sweet. He leads me beside still waters. Oh, that is so refreshing. He restores my soul. That is awesome. David is doing some good writing here. This is so good about God. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So everything's sweet and good. Everything's about God. Tell you about God. Tell you about my relationship with God. Tell you what I think about God. All of a sudden, David walks through the valley of the shadow of death. All of a sudden, something happens in David's day. Something puts him in, 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 a, in a death march. And I just want you to see what happens now. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm just saying, did you notice the difference in the pronoun? I mean, did you notice what happened? David's writing about God. Everything's good. Everything's happy. And he's telling you about God's my shepherd. He leads me. He does. All this. And then all of a sudden, he goes to the valley of the shadow of death, and he says, God, you're with me. God, you're there. God, you comfort me. God, you... I mean, he stops talking about God and starts talking to God. 
And I'm just saying the same thing happens with us, man. We're walking down Marshmallow Lane and everything's going fine and we fat, happy, and sassy, got plenty of money in the bank and the kids making A's and everything else. We down there and our prayer is, oh God, you are so good, you are so wonderful, you are so awesome. And then all of a sudden, man, the kids flunk out of school. Um, somebody shows up at our door with the summons and we got to, you know, we, we, we direct the car and the neighbors are complaining about it. And all of a sudden it's, God, help me, God, you got to walk in my life, God, you got to, all of a sudden you are not talking about about God anymore. You're talking to God. And I'm just saying that when it seems God doesn't come through, it gives us a presence of God in our life that we don't get desperate enough to have when everything's happy. One final story. You got time for it? This story right here, man, I'm telling you. I heard Dr. Frank Pollard, and I know y'all don't know his name, but he was pastor of First Baptist Church in Jackson. He has a wife named Jane. And I used to be a Baptist and all that, and I used to be in some high circles. But uh, I heard him at a conference, and his wife, Jane, told this story now. She had <clears throat> some friends, and this friend had a daughter that went to college up east in one of the eastern colleges. And, uh, and this daughter was at the library. I mean, this girl was at the library studying. Well, if you didn't get back to the dorm at a certain time, you got demerits. So it got late, and the young lady, instead of going around the lighted sidewalk and so forth, she cut through the little, a little small wooded section that was there. It was a shortcut to back to the dorm. And when she went into those woods, out stepped what she described. She said this was this, was this big, burly Man, this guy was nasty looking, just, he was, and, and he just, he just looked at me. And she said, I just kept walking. I didn't say a word. I just kept walking. And, and, and I walked right, and he was just standing there looking. He just, and I walked right past him. He was just looking at me. And said, man, he was just, you, you know, she said, I was scared to death. Well, about six o'clock the next morning, the, the, the dorm people, the dorm monitors woke up all the, the people in the dorm, in the women's dorm, because a girl had been attacked that night in that wooded area, had been assaulted. And they wanted to know if any of those girls had been through that area, had seen anything, or had anything that could help the police with catching this guy. And this girl said, I have. I, last night I did. I went through there just before this thing happened with this other girl, evidently. And so they took her down to the police station and they had a lineup and, they, and she picked the guy out of the lineup that she saw. And as they were leading him out, she asked the detective, may I speak to him a second? And he said, well, don't get too close, but you can speak a say. He said, I just want to say, just want to ask one question. That's all. I'm not going, I'm not going to hassle him or anything. And she walked over there to this guy, and she said, you remember me, don't you? Yep. All I want to ask you is, why didn't you attack me? Why did you attack her, and you didn't attack me? And he looked at her, she said, with the most puzzling look on his face, and said, with, with that big guy that you had with you? <laughs> that big guy? There wasn't any guy with her. Or was it? I'm, see, I'm just saying to you. Suffering, stress, tension brings the presence of God into our life. Like it can't be can't be had in any other way. Yeah, yeah. Suffering. Count it all joy, he said. How, that's, why, that's what he's saying. Count it all joy. Man, that God's presence is there. You're there. He's dependable. You count on God. And all that's from, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah.